I want to welcome you all here this evening and sorrowly say that this is uh, the last night of our meeting. Uh, we've had a good time, I think, uh, as well as a, a lot of things to think about. And I want to thank all of you for joining us, as well as uh, the congregation here for inviting me to speak and giving me such excellent topics in such a, a manner as for a gospel meeting. <clears throat> Why not? Now, before we begin, I do want to mention that I know it's, it's convoluted, it's a little bit weird, but uh, your outlines, if you received one, are double-sided. The first night's lesson, which was Why Jesus, is on one side, and tonight's lesson, Why Not, is on the other. That's simply so that uh, those of you who wanted one could have the first night's lesson if they wanted to make reference to it or write notes on it or whatever they might want to do, throw it up, throw it away, whatever. It's up to you. Um, unfortunately, the papers don't come three-sided, or the third lesson or the second lesson would be on there too. Um, but they haven't figured that out yet. So, but uh, if you were still wanting one, I'd be happy to give you one at a future date because I don't have any right now. Um, but uh, anyway, why not? So why Jesus? Why now? And why not? What a weird question. And I know what you're thinking. We've spent the past two nights discussing why we should get our life right with Jesus, whether that means in baptism or effectively returning to Christ and his will because we've walked away from it, and that we should do it right now. And there is no time for delay, and there is no reason for delay. Considering all the blessings that we receive, not only the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places and ultimately a place in heaven awaiting us, but also the benefits that we receive here. And now, you're going to tell me that there are good reasons not to be baptized. That's right. Now, I know that sounds controversial, but bear with me for just a few moments. Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, John dealt with something similar. Luke chapter 3, John the Baptist prepares the way for Christ. He comes about six months before Jesus comes on the scene, introduces himself to the world through the miracles that he would perform and the lessons that he would teach. And John was the one who, it says there in verse 4, the fulfillment of the words of Isaiah the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John came to prepare the way for Jesus, specifically. And he would be incredibly humble about that. I'm not sure I would be as humble as John was, considering the role that John is going to play. But John comes to prepare the way for the Lord. And the idea from the book of Isaiah is very reminiscent of the way the, our, our, um, I lost the word, um, our roadways are constructed. The idea is that you take the shortest path between two points. And so when we had opportunity to bore a hole in the side of a mountain in order to make the way straighter so we didn't have to go around mountains, we did that. And when you could fill in valleys, we used bridges to cross them then you would do that, right? You would do whatever it was to expedite the transportation of the people, and that's what he's talking about here. That John came in order to help people realize the message of Jesus, ultimately, and to come to terms with who Jesus was. Because he's going to point them to Jesus, while Jesus points them to God, ultimately. And it says there in verse 7 that he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, because this was a pretty spectacular thing, this guy out in the wilderness, this wild man effectively, he wore a camel hair vest and a brown uh, belt, which is really significant considering the prophets haven't been seen in 500 years, and he's wearing the garb of the prophets. And he's the first to do so in a very long time, and so he draws a lot of attention. He has a weird diet, eats locusts and wild honey, and a lot of people go out to hear him, simply to hear him. You know people that are like that. 
And it says there that when they came out to be baptized by him, notice it doesn't say he just baptized everyone who came. It doesn't say he, there were no requirements in order to, of understanding in order to be baptized. In fact, the, the very opposite is the case. These people are coming out to be baptized by him, and John knows something about some of them. Not all of them, obviously, because he was baptizing a lot of people at this time. But some of the people who came out, he said, he said no. He said, look at that, verse at the end of verse 7, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. There are times where the body of Christ in the past has been very aggressive in getting people in the baptistry. Now, respecting the nature and the call of people to be baptized and allowing them or participating in their baptism is an excellent thing. But there have been times in the past where the body of Christ has practically body-slammed people in the baptistry. Now, if that's what we're looking for, we could get a, a van together, and we could, we could hollow out the inside with, out of all the seats, and we could fill it with water, and we could just drive by and just throw people in, right? If that were really effectively what you were trying to accomplish, because getting people in the water seems to have been our ultimate goal in the past. And John said that's not the case, even in the baptism of repentance that he's talking about here. He demands, verse 8, that they bring fruit forth fruits worthy of repentance, that they establish that they want to change from the life that they've been living. And look at what kinds of things he calls them to do in verse 9. And even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Things are changing, he says. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? There are a lot of people who ask that question in the Bible. And they get, oftentimes, the same answer. Obedience. It has to do with obedience. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? Verse 10. Verse 11. He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. That's a weird thing to require of people. Be generous. Because currently you're not. And as far as we see Jesus' recommendations or condemnation of the Pharisees, specifically in Matthew chapter 23, that would certainly be the case. They needed to change a number of things about their lifestyle and what they were teaching others also. And then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. He says, Be fair with people. He doesn't tell them to stop being tax collectors. He just says, Be fair with people. In verse 14, likewise, soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. He says it's a change of attitude. It's a change of mindset that is what we're requiring. And that's what Jesus is going to lead people to. They wanted, they wanted rules and regulations. They wanted specific checklist mentality that was from the Old Testament. And John, even before Jesus comes on the scene, what does he require of them? But to change the way they see the world around them. To change the way they act and they live their lives to meet what God was calling them to do. And until they did that, John said, no. He said, you're not ready to be baptized. John says, yeah. Why Jesus? Why now? Yeah. But he also said that there are good reasons not to be baptized. I have heard a lot of things. I have heard a lot of reasons that people gave to be baptized. And I knew that if they were baptized because of the reasonings they were giving, what was ultimately going to happen was they were simply going to get wet. And there's not a real great reason simply to get wet. It wasn't going to change anything in their lives. It wasn't going to change their relationship with God. If anything, all it would inevitably do was confuse them later on when they might truly want to be baptized for the remission of their sins. But then they would think to this time in the past when... They were truly faithful to God. They had no intention of being righteous, but they simply wanted to get wet. 
And someone allowed them to get wet. Somebody was okay with that because they wanted their numbers to go up or they wanted the, uh, to laud this success in their life. But they weren't really thinking about the person. One time in one of my works, I had a little girl come to me. She was probably nine or ten. She came forward. And everyone was real happy. I only seen her three times ever in her entire life. And she came forward and I asked her, I asked her why she wanted to be saved. Because I have not been one who likes rushing people into the baptistry. If they're ready, then we'll go. Absolutely. But I always ask a couple of questions. And I asked her why she wanted to be baptized. And she said, so that I could lead singing. And I thought that was kind of funny. She obviously had no idea, first and foremost, what baptism was for. And even if she were faithful and she were to be baptized, obedience to God comes first and that ain't going to happen. I've heard people say that they want to do this so it's the best thing for their children or their spouse. They wanted to be baptized because they knew that it would help their child be faithful to God. And I'm trying to figure out how that makes any sense. But I've heard it, and I've heard it more than once. People, I think Michael Whitworth said this, people will do things for their children or their grandchildren that wouldn't even do for themselves. And that was the case in, in this matter. And it took us a while, but we finally got to the point where they understood that the best thing for their child ultimately was for them themselves to put their soul first. And that's what we're called to do as Christians. It's in fact a kind of a selfish thing, if, not, if anything else. Yeah, we're giving ourselves to the Lord, and yes, we're, we're giving up certain aspects of our life, absolutely, but... What we're gaining is so much more valuable than what we're giving up. There are times to be selfish. Some individuals won't let a person date their child unless they're a Christian, unless they're, they're baptized. And I've seen people get baptized for that reason. I've seen people get baptized to get folks off their back. Usually these are young people. When their parents really want them to be saved. And I understand that. But if you're rushing a child to be baptized when they're not ready to be baptized, and they're not ready to commit themselves to the Lord, then you're doing them a great disservice. I had a family one time ask me, ask me to sit down with their child. And I knew what was going on because we'd had these discussions before. And I consented, yeah, I'll sit down with them. I'll talk to them. That's all I promised. I'm not going to pick them up and throw them in the baptistry. This guy was kind of big. I'm not sure I could have but he was a young man. He was about 16 years old. And I talked to him. And after we got done talking, she thought it was a terrible failure. And I told her that it was, a, it was an absolute success. Because he wasn't just getting baptized to make you happy, to get you off his back, to get you to stop worrying about him all the time. And the fact that he wouldn't do it, the fact that he wouldn't be baptized simply to get you off his back implied he recognized a value to it. That he was associating with something important, an important decision on his side of this equation. And he was right. And whether he was ready or not, the fact that he wasn't willing to means that he wasn't ready. <laughs> whether he should have been or not is an entirely different subject. The fact of the matter was he respected what baptism was. Because he refused to be baptized simply to get his mom off his back. And that's something. It's not as much as you like, but it's something more than what you think you have. And it's oftentimes about perspective. It has to do with people not really being ready to fully commit, and I understand that. And John, the Baptist, understood that there in Luke chapter 3. In Acts chapter 26, we see something similar. Acts chapter 26... In verse 24, notice a little bit of background. Paul has been in prison for a short amount of time, depending on your concept of short. He hasn't yet been transferred to Rome, and he hasn't gone through this wild adventure, let's call it an adventure, over the Mediterranean in order to get there. But he is still around Israel, 
Uh, and he is given opportunity to talk to people. And currently he's talking, he was talking to Festus and Agrippa, the king, the king of the Israelites at the time, or some individual who is very high ranking. He gets an opportunity to speak to Paul. And in 24 it says, Now as he thus made his defense, that would be Paul, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. Now, it's important to remember what's going on. Festus is a Gentile. He doesn't have much background in the Old Testament. Agrippa, on the other hand, is a Jew and absolutely does. And Paul's defense is not to Festus, but to Agrippa. And so it's very entrenched in the Old Testament. You could read it if you wanted from 19 on. He accesses the Old Testament and Agrippa's understanding of the Old Testament, how Jesus fulfills that Old Testament, the very argument he made so many times through the synagogues, not the same argument he makes to the Gentiles, because that argument doesn't mean anything to the Gentiles. So when Festus hears this, he doesn't really understand what's going on. He doesn't really equate the things that Paul is talking about to the Old Testament because of his lack of, his lack of understanding there. But in verse 25, but he said, that is Paul, I am... Not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king, that be Agrippa, before whom I also speak freely, knows these things. Agrippa knows exactly what I'm talking about. And what we'll see is Agrippa, I have to imagine, is nodding there. Yeah, I know what you're talking about, Paul. He knows these things, for I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention. Since this thing was not done in a corner, it wasn't done in some far-off place, it wasn't done in secret, the very argument that Jesus makes when he gets brought into trial with the Sanhedrin. When he finally sees his day in this ridiculous court, and they're accusing him of so many things and asking him so many questions, and Jesus' response so often is, well, what I've done is not in secret. <laughs> Can't you build enough of a case with the witnesses that you have that I did something wrong? And the fact of the matter was that they couldn't even pay people to get false accusations. They couldn't get enough people to agree on what actually happened to bring an accusation against him. In verse 27, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe, he says. Then Agrippa said to Paul, words I have effectively heard. Far too many times. Words that I effectively said myself far too many times. He says, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. And I love Paul's answer here. He says, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am. Except for these chains. I'm not asking just in case you misunderstood me, I'm not asking that you be in chains like I am. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that I wish that you had the same confirmation of faith in Jesus Christ that you could be saved according to his teachings. That you could receive what I have received. Even though I'm going through all these trials and he's probably fairly short, things aren't going to go too terribly well as he moves forward in his life. But even then he wishes for all of the people in the council that are sitting around him both Agrippa and Festus and all of the counselors and even Agrippa's wife, I wish that you were not just almost, but all together as I am. I wish that I could persuade you, and the problem ultimately comes that Paul couldn't force Agrippa to become a Christian. He couldn't just throw him in the baptistry and be done with it, not only because he wasn't he was bound and chained, but ultimately because that wouldn't have suited anything. That wouldn't have solved any problems. And we find Paul goes his way and inevitably is taken to Rome, no longer having access to Agrippa. Who knows what happens to Agrippa? A little weird, but it's not appropriate to answer your rhetorical questions. What happens to him after this? I don't know. But I know Paul gave his all in teaching him. And it fell flat for the time being. And we don't know if something else happened after, but what we do know is that at that moment, it wasn't enough. And that's okay. If you aren't ready to put your whole self into the work, then there's no point. Jesus himself says this very point in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 and verse 10. In verse 10 he says, And that's not what I'm looking for. 
were interested. It should be... Let's go to verse 23. It says, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. It was a choice that each and every one of them had to make. That some of them would want to come and follow. And he says, Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and works, uh, and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. We have to be fully committed to this work in order to join it. We can't be half-hearted in it. And that's the rub sometimes. We would really like people to be saved, and I would really love to be involved in people's salvation, but I can't force them to become saved. I can't force any of you to put on Christ. I can't force you to return to Him, even as much as I would like to. There are a number of people, ultimately the world at large, but there are a few select individuals that I would be ecstatic if they became Christians. And I have worked diligently. Some of them have passed on before they made that decision. But it was theirs to make. And one day, one day this world will be at an end. And those who are faithful will become part of his kingdom in the afterlife. Rather than just here in this life. In fact, if we turn to first, uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter would argue something similarly. In 2 Peter chapter 2, notice in verse 20. He says, For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. He says, For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow, having washed to her wallowing in the mire. He says there in verse 21, it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to having known it return from the holy command delivered to them, to return to your, your vomit. And I wonder how that works exactly. <laughs> Why? Why is it worse to come to a knowledge of the truth and to become a Christian and then walk away than if you never became a Christian at all. And whatever we might speculate that to be, at the very least, if you are in hell because of the decisions that you made, you know how close you came. You know that you had it in your hands and you gave it up. You know that you are the reason absolutely that you are there. <coughs> And if nothing else, that would have to make my eternity and condemnation worse, if such a thing could exist. A worse experience in hell. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13, the way of Christ is not for everyone, but he gives everyone the chance to choose. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13, he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. There's a, a meme online that's a, a picture or a, a saying that gets passed around over and over again. And they reference song titles, right? The Highway to Hell and the Stairway to Heaven. And they make a joke about how that implies the expected traffic. <coughs> and while I don't like drawing conclusions from earthly songs and things people come up with, that's what I read here in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13 and 14. Many there are who go in by it. They go into destruction. They choose the path that leads them to that destruction. In verse 14, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Many will go the wrong way. Few will go the right way. It's available for all, but not all will choose. The parable of the soils describe three or four souls that will not hold to the promises of God, no matter how amazing. One of them won't even accept it to begin with. But two, the idea even that 
these individuals, they receive the word of God and it's implanted in them and it begins to grow, implies that they become a Christian. So two of those groups, though they're not going to last very long because of the temptations or the trials of this world, is going to burn them out effectively. Or the temptations and the struggles of this life are going to kill them like <coughs> weeds in a garden. One of four are the ones who receive those promises and endure to the end those amazing benefits that we all can have. There are really good reasons not to get wet. But on the other hand, there are some really bad reasons not to be baptized. Some things that might be holding you back from committing yourself to Christ. I can't tell you how often I've heard this one. I, I don't think I can live perfectly. And when people say that, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. And when people say that, I am tempted to laugh at them. Because they're right. But that's not the point. And that's where we get to this problem. They think they have to reach a certain level of righteousness before they can become a Christian. Paul was on his way to take Christians prisoner and take them back to Jerusalem and steal their things and cast them out of society. And even he was a part of murdering Christians when Jesus came to him. How much worse could your life be? How much worse could the decisions that you have made affect your salvation? They don't. Not once you become a Christian. I don't think I can live perfectly. You're right. But that's not the issue. In, in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John is, is one of the most encouraging books I've read. If I had to list them in order, I think I'd go 2 Corinthians, because 2 Corinthians is an amazing book. It's all about the changes that the church in Corinth made. It's amazing, especially on the back of 1 Corinthians. Whoo, man, that's harsh. 2 Corinthians, and I'd go 1 John. 1 John is such an amazing book. And notice with me here, 1 John chapter 2, notice in verse 1, he says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. We stop. No, no, don't keep going. Stop right there. John says, I wrote these things so that you wouldn't sin. That's the way we read it. We read it as if God expects us no longer to have any issues whatsoever, to never struggle ever again, or to reach a certain plateau of spirituality before we become a Christian. That's absurd. That's ridiculous. In fact, that's the opposite of what he's saying. Read it again. He says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The fearful thing is to go to that judgment and to stand before a righteous God. And in Revelation chapter 20, it describes the books that are going to be opened. And there's a series of books that are going to be opened. And the books that are opened of your account might, are going to be different than the books that are opened in my account. They're going to be the works that I have accomplished in this life. And the one unequivocal thing that we're, conclusion we're going to come to is that I didn't live a righteous life. That I don't deserve to go to heaven on my own. But then another book is going to be opened. And it's going to be checked. And if my name is in that book, the Lamb's Book of Life, then all of those books and all of those things that I accomplished in this life, bad and somewhat good, aren't going to matter anymore. And that's what John is saying here. The same guy who recorded the works of Revelation also recorded First John. He knows what he's talking about. When we go to the judgment, who do you want on your side? Jesus Christ the righteous. You want the son of the judge. The one who wrote the book of the word. He himself is our propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the whole world. We need to have access to that one. We need to recognize that the church is a hospital for the spiritually sick, not a museum for holy relics. We're not holy relics, and we never will be. We are sick. We are individuals who struggle with sin, who fail at times. And all we're trying to do is fail less than we have in the past. We're trying to accomplish that one goal in our life, to make it to heaven and to carry as many with us as possible. We can't carry them. Help them. 
In 1 John chapter 1, notice in verse 7. He says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, we get the wrong idea about this verse sometimes. We think, well, you receive the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses your sins if you walk in the light, and we conclude that walking in the light means living perfectly. That doesn't make any sense. If that's the case, then he's offering you something you don't even need. If your walking in the light means that you live perfectly according to Christ, then you don't need the remission of your sins. You don't need the blood of Christ. Amen. This is a passage to people who are going to fall and stumble and struggle and need salvation anyway. It'd be like saying, I'm going to open a food pantry for the rich. What kind of sense does that make? No one's going to need it because the people who could use it no longer need it. The people who do need it don't work out in relation to its credentials or its requirements. But in fact, he says there in verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And then we're going to go to verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Confession is important. The willingness to admit fault. When those books are open and the judgment comes down, it's not going to be that you're innocent. The accusation from the accuser, the one sitting on the other side of the bench from Jesus, if he's there, is going to be the devil. And his accusation is going to be, well, you did all of these awful things. And the Lord is going to say, because he's judge, he's going to say, what do you plead? These are the accusations that are made. How do you plead? And how are we going to plead? We're going to plead like the rest of the world does all the time, not guilty. You never admit guilt. You never accept responsibility for your actions. Are you kidding me? Then why did Jesus die? If he died for our sins, in that day, when we are accused of these things, when they open these books and they can run down the list of all the awful things that we have ever done in our entire life, the answer from us needs to be guilty. And what does it say in verse 9? If we confess our sins, that is confirm what the Lord has accused us of. What the devil has brought against us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not only, we're going to win this court case, but it is not going to be on the back of a non-guilty verdict. It's going to be because Jesus is our advocate. If Jesus is our advocate. It's going to be because Jesus is the propitiation. That just means stand-in or sacrifice. That he already died so that you could live. Knowing.